Uh, so my name is Simon Peyton Jones. I work here at Microsoft's Research Lab in Cambridge. And uh, what I study is programming languages themselves. So every computer is programmed using some language or another. A programming language is just the way that you explain to a computer what you want it to do. So then it's a little bit like an architect building a building. If you want to, if you build a building out of um, uh, bananas, you can build one that's so high. But if you switch to um, steel girders, you can build a much higher and more ambitious building. So if you design prog programming languages, are like the building materials of computing. If you can build your programs out of languages that are robust, that make it harder to make errors, make it easier to make programs that work correctly, then you can build more ambitious programs. Uh, so my particular interest is in a class of programming languages called functional programming languages, of which Haskell is the one that I work on, but most, um, most of you will probably be more familiar with spreadsheets. So in a spreadsheet, when you write a formula, you don't say, do this and then do that, and then if that is true, do something else, which is what most people think of when they think of computer programming. Instead you say, the value of this cell is the sum of those other two cells. And then you have another cell that says, and this cell is the square root of that one. And you expect the spreadsheet to work out the order in which things are done. So it's more declarative, that is, it says what the answer is, rather than imperative, saying do this and then do this. The surprising thing is that you can turn that idea of writing programs into a whole programming language that can do absolutely anything at all. And moreover, that class of languages, which are called functional languages, are deeply rooted in the intellectual foundations of computer science itself. So uh, Alan Turing designed the Turing machine, which is one of our definitions of what it means to be computable, and Alonzo Church described the lambda calculus, and then they discovered that these two ways of thinking about computation were identical. Well, functional programming languages are very direct descendants of the lambda calculus. So there's a very close interplay between theory and practice in the work that I do, which is a real thrill, because after all, I'm a researcher, so the interplay between theory and practice is very important to me. So what skills are important in what I do? Well, I do a lot of programming, um, even though I've, um, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm happy to say that I still get to write a lot of code, and I love it. And computers force you to be very precise in your way of thinking. Computer programs are among the largest artifacts, that is the largest things that human beings have ever built. We don't have a visceral sense of that. If you look at the Eiffel Tower, you see something enormous and impressive. If you look at a computer program, maybe even the program that processes your email, um, or some stuff that's running on a server somewhere else, you don't realize that it consists of millions and millions of lines of code. It's like, a, it's like only being able to see the, the Eiffel Tower through a, a one foot wide uh, porthole. You can only see a little bit at the time. So, Computer programs are extremely large and complicated, um, so that forces us to think carefully about how to build them. In particular, it forces us to build them in a very modular way. So we try to build one piece, wrap it up in a box, and then treat it as a little unit that we can then use to build new pieces. It's a bit like building a prefabri prefabricated building. You build the chunks of the building as you know, the, the, a wall entire, and then you start gluing walls together to build rooms, and then you build rooms together to build houses. Um, and so the same habits of thought um, inform the way that we build programs. Um, and so uh, every day I'm trying to think, how can I structure the compiler that I'm writing so that it will be understandable to somebody else in 10 years' time? Because every program has as one of its primary authors, primary readers rather, the people who will be reading that program in 10 years' time, not just the computer that's going to execute it. But the computer that's going to execute it is a wonderful aid to pointing out what's wrong with it. It's completely, what's the word, uh, ruthless about saying, you idiot, you failed to think of this case and I'm just going to crash now. Um, so uh, it encourages precision of thought and I like that. It's a good discipline. Yeah, so when I was, um, when I was at school, uh, our school had one computer made by IBM. It was an IBM school um, computer and I was thrilled to be allowed to program it. it had 100 memory locations. Uh, that was the, that had for the program and the data. That was it. By the time I got to university, the, uh, I, came, I studied here at Cambridge, and Cambridge at that time did not have a computer science degree. Um, so I did maths instead. So I studied maths, and in my final year I studied electrical sciences. But in my spare time I did a lot of computing. I built myself a computer by uh, wiring it together with, with bits of wire, and I, I, at that stage microprocessors had just become available. So computing was always a kind of hobby for me. And when I left university, I um, joined a small company where 
I started to use computers for, for real, um, and then I became a lecturer at University College London. So I, had, I really had no formal education in computer science. Things are very different these days. Uh, now uh, every university has a computer science department, has full three-year uh, computer, computer science degrees, and a recent change in our school curriculum means that everybody will be studying computer science as a school subject, something I think that's really very important as well. So I came to it late and almost by accident, like many people, but I think that will change in the future. What's the most rewarding part of my job? Well, I guess there are two bits at the moment. One is that when I said I work on a, a functional programming language, um, the language is called Haskell. It's an open source project, which means that many, many people work on it. Um, but I was one of the people who helped design the language and who built uh, the first compiler for it. It's called GHC. And so what's satisfying to me is that thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people are using Haskell every day. I continue to get email from them saying, what about this and could you do that? So I have a very live dialogue with many, well, not individually with many thousands of people, but I know there's a user community of hundreds of thousands of people who are using this kind of intellectual tool with this interplay between theory and practice every day to get their jobs done, and that's a real thrill. What's my latest challenge? I think it's this. I'm the um, chair of the Computing at School Working Group, which is a group of individuals who wanted to um, shift the focus of the ICT curriculum from being concentrating mainly on the use and application of computers, as important though that is, to understanding how computer systems work and to think of computer science as a discipline alongside, um, alongside maths and science and, and English and history, the established disciplines of our school life. Um, so seeing the, uh, the new national curriculum explicitly espouse the idea of the discipline of computer science as part of every school's curriculum has been a real thrill. The challenge that we're now addressing is that we have thousands and thousands of school teachers, there are three and a half thousand secondary schools and 25,000 odd primary schools in the land, all of whom are now facing the challenge of teaching this stuff, but who have not really been trained and equipped to do so. And my, um, my impression is that almost all ICT teachers uh, in secondary schools and primary teachers are um, open and sometimes even eager to learn this new stuff, but we need to support and equip and encourage them to do so. And that's a really big challenge, that's a kind of national scale challenge that I think all of us in the tech community need to stand up to. Um, and the, uh, the Computing School Working Group, this, the group that I refer to, which is of which I'm chair in partnership with the British Computer Society and indeed with many others, are um, uh, trying to do just that, launch a nationwide training program for all of our teachers to try to put them in a position where they can confidently and enthusiastically deliver the new computing curriculum. It's actually an amazing inflection point, it's very exciting. Um, many teachers, many ICT teachers have come into their subject from business studies or from humanities and they, they're doing, you know, they're good teachers doing a good job but they don't necessarily have the background for the new subject that we're asking them to teach. So that is a real challenge. I think it's one that they're up for, um, but I think that's probably the biggest challenge that schools face. It's not kit, really. I mean, kit is important, but the real big challenge they face is the knowledge and, more important, the confidence of those teachers to feel, yes, this is something that I, I understand the educational case for it. I'm excited to learn it myself. I'm excited to share it with my students. Um, that's a real challenge. And getting from where we are to that situation. Once they're in that situation of feeling, um, yes, I'm enthusiastic about this, I want to learn, then I think you know, there's, there's a cornucopia of resources to support them. The um, OCR, CUP, MOOC is uh, among them, um, but uh, uh, there's, there's plenty of material, but it, it's the, the confidence and the support of their fellow teachers that will help them to do that. Um, so uh, that's what CAS is busy doing at the moment, um, and uh, I, the, um, through the mechanism of CAS Online. People, if, if, if uh, um, teachers who want to get a nose into this should just type computing at school into their web browser and then just join CAS. It's free, it doesn't send you any spam and uh, you get access to this big community. At the moment it's about 4,000 teachers and a couple of thousand other people in this country who are keen to make all this work.